This is the Friday, September 30th, 2016 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Dan Huber. Dan, welcome back. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. We did not get a chance to discuss the cotton market. How's it doing? You know, uh, nothing exciting happening in the cotton market. Now, uh, six weeks ago or so, you know, we did finally kind of break out of this two or three year range that we'd been in and boy, it looked like we were ready to go to the dance. You know, we, we've held closer to the 70 cent range, which now we used to be 68 to 70 was kind of the upper side of the range. Uh, we've slipped a little bit below there now. So I mean, at least at least our lows now are what used to be the highs over the last two years. But, you know, certainly nothing that's exciting or runaway at this point in time. So no it, additional, uh, I mean, harvest news or import-export no, news to yeah, drive it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I mean, still we're still a relatively stagnant market. Now, granted, uh, you know, harvest is, you know, for the many of those people, later in the year yet. So it. Uh, now I was in the South here, oh, I guess, six, eight weeks ago. And, you know, depending where you're at, there was a lot of uh, a lot of areas that cotton was really not looking the greatest. Now, I, I will we shall see what they uh, they come up with the next uh, the next production report. But it's uh, you know like like any crop. I mean, there's a, we have to get it out of the field before we can really uh, really determine if it's going to be a, a supply situation or demand or, or supply problem situation or not. So yeah. well, and that that does a pretty good job of leading us into our first question. Alrighty. here from uh, one of our Twitter followers. This is from Will in Jasper County. We asked his pro his other question on the program. He's wondering, do the grain markets appear to be forming technical price bottoms for the season, or do we have significant downside risk in prices yet ahead of us? You know, and again, of course, this is a personal bias, which I guess that's partially why I'm here. But I, I, I really think we are in that process of establishing that seasonal low. And, uh, you know, I, I've always maintained, you know, if, you, if we listen to markets, they'll, they'll tell us a story. And, you know, too often we want to tell the market what to do. But, you know, if you really step back and look at it, the market continues to get bearish news and bearish news and bearish news, but it doesn't seem to go down. And to me, I think that's telling the story that, yeah, we've heard this. This is enough is enough. We're at a point of value. And as we did uh, discuss you know, briefly before, here we've got people like Mexico coming in, buying some very large quantities of corn. I think they're looking at these these price ranges and saying, geez, you know, for the next year, for the next 18 months, you know, these are uh, acceptable levels and we're ready to start owning this. So I think it's a uh, personal bias. Yes, I think we're at the lows right now. Granted, we may not turn out of here rapidly, but on the same token, I, I just don't think we have a lot of downside risk at this point in time. Do you think we are we're necessarily waiting until post January 1 to really move out of it? Are we in a, let's talk corn, 318 to 350 range until January 1. You know the uh, if you if you look over the last couple of years that's been our tendency we get into fall we we that fourth quarter we really turn sideways and then we have to we wait for the either the confirmation or lack of confirmation on that January production the final production number before we come back out of there. So uh, so now interestingly enough if you look at just the December corn features at this point we've had a lid recently at 345. Then we get 345, we break back down to about 320, 325. Now for whatever reason, Reason, if we did happen to punt through that 345 area, I think we'd put another 20 cents out in a hurry. We could be up to 365, maybe an even extreme of 380, but you would you would have to believe that would be accompanied by some other elements like a weaker dollar or some bad weather or something to to really panic the uh, the short out to uh, to make that happen. So from <clears throat> what you're hearing, and you do travel quite a bit, I know mm -hmm. you've been out of the country, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of springing this on you. Sure. What have you heard about basis? Are, are we seeing significant weakening through parts of the Corn Belt, or is it hanging tight in there. You, you don't want to end. Granted, uh, we're really not that far into harvest yet to where you've seen you know, any major storage issues and that type other than something very localized. You know, just gauging from our area from what I see when we come back, we're just looking at some pretty average basis levels okay. in our neck of the woods. So it's, uh, now granted, uh, we maybe are a little better, you know, Northern Illinois could be a little better storage surplus area than many parts of the country, but on the same token, uh, now, uh, I'll, I'll take back to the east where they have had a little more uh, ongoing harvest. Although yields have not been as substantial over there, uh, basis levels have been under some pressure over to the Indiana, Ohio, maybe even Pennsylvania area. So it's, uh, you know, the demand is maybe uh, just not as strong as it uh, has been for the last couple of years. At Probably going to so. see that make its way across the country Moving, as well. Right, right, exactly. All right. Now we've got a question. As folks are out there in the combine, they're running the grain cart, they're thinking, what am I going to do for next year? Mm -hmm. Seed companies are knocking on my door. Got to take advantage of those early buying deals. David in central Iowa wants to know, how much will the soybean corn price ratio affect seed and planting decisions for next year? You know, the, uh, I mean, just looking at the raw numbers here right now, I, I don't see a major advan advantage to being one or the other. Now, granted, this year we're seeing 
in, in many areas what seemed to be some pre fairly substantial bean yields, you know, which would kind of temper guys to thinking that, uh, you know, maybe maybe we finally turned the corner where we consistently can put out average to above average uh, soybean yields uh, and not have the drag we've had against corn. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, as, as much as anything, I think it's basically going to uh, boil down to where they're looking at in financing. Uh, I mean, certainly weather always plays in there, so I, I guess we're not looking for any major shifts. Okay. Uh, if I had a personal bias, I would tend to think we'd lose a little bit of soybean acres next year, uh, just because we did uh, tend to be a little bit heavier this year, but it's, uh, uh, that, that's a guess better than anything else at this okay. point in time. So. Even when you look at this market structure, Dan, and we have these conversations about ending stocks mm -hmm. in particular, um, boy, it's, beans have a pretty compelling story over the past couple mm -hmm. years. I mean, we've seen ending stocks continually never be where we anticipated uh, the first part of the year. You know, in the uh, looking out into 2017, the people we speak with in the export market say that's probably not gonna go away. Now, granted, the market's become very accustomed to seeing particularly China in there as a major buyer, but it has for me for two years now. That Chinese demand, I think, has shocked everybody in the cash grain market, and we've tried to build carry out. We tried to build carry out, here we find out again that, you know, this, this afternoon or this morning, I should say, that we're not even going to have a 200 million bushel carry in after a substantial crop last year and a substantial crop in South America. So it's, uh, you know, we may, you know, talk all we want about a 350 or 400 million bushel carry out at the end of next year. If we can actually make that materialize, I, I think is a, is a big guess at this point in time. So uh, granted, it's, you know, we're, we're banking a lot on China continuing to be that, that major demand for us out there, but for all intents and purposes, there's no reason to doubt that they won't be at this sure. point in time. So. They're still in the market today buying, and our export commitments are very large oh, looking absolutely. into the future. Absolutely. We've absolutely. got a question. This one's from Ben Ranchi up in Jessup, Iowa. And Ben, well, we've kind of answered this, but we'll see if there's anything else you want to add. When do we settle into the low for these markets? You know what, again, if you just look at normal seasonal patterns, we're there. I mean, that, that, that is probably something that... Uh, that hopefully will give us a, a, a supportive psychological factor. You know, I, I really think too, if you, uh, we haven't really discussed much about funds and we know funds have come into this period relatively short, particularly in wheat and corn. But I think if you look over the last several years, funds have probably been better seasonal traders than the most of us. And generally around this time of the year, they continue, they begin to lighten up on those short positions. And uh, if that same pattern holds in, in fact I intact, then you've really eliminated a you know what would be a a, uh, a selling pressure within right. the market you know and doesn't necessarily turn into major rallies, but you know it, it stabilizes that market and helps us to build that base. Good to have another buyer. It's always good to have another bid. Oh, absolutely. And realistically, commodity markets tend to bottom on long, drawn-out basing patterns. And, uh, you know, we've really been doing that for the last two months already. Yeah. So it's just a matter of uh, can we extend that for another 30 or 60 days now? And depending so. on who you talk to, we've been doing it for the past three years. Oh, well, very true. <laughs> very true. Yeah. Uh, we've got a final question for you here. Sure. This one's from Matt at Farmer Fuss. He's asking, when Deutsche Bank collapses, how will it impact the derivatives desk, the dollar, and interest rates? The... Uh, uh, you know, and of course, uh, and I'll throw an if, Deutsche Bank collapsed, and, and they've had a, a lot of negative news here recently. If that did come to fruition, certainly it would be stronger to the dollar. I mean, it would be positive in the dollar, just in the respect that uh, people are going to panic and want to come back into uh, what they view as the most secure currency, the, the most dependable uh, uh, interest rate payable at this point in time, as, as, as minor as that may be. You know, that said, I, I really... Uh, don't think the either the German government or the EU as a whole is going to allow that to happen, much like we did not allow it to happen with our banks back in the 2008-2009 period. Uh, you know, that would just create so much financial havoc. It, 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 uh, I, I don't think there's a strong likelihood, uh, but on the same token, you know, there's, there's enough people unsettled in this market. And I think that's probably one of the things that continues to allow the dollar to, not that we're rallying, but hold at the levels we are, because there's nothing in there that really says the dollar should be holding here, particularly with Asia looking like they're starting to see a little bit of an economic rebound here at this point in time. So, All right, we've got one final question okay. for Dan Huber. Before you go, we um, want to ask you, we had the Fed meeting, Janet Yellen spoke this week, sure. and every time we have a discussion about the Federal, Federal Reserve and so many other topics, people say, oh, he's hawkish, oh, she's dovish. Sure. Our question to you is, what are hawkish and dovish comments? Certainly. Well, and particularly when you're referring to the Fed, uh, a, somebody who's hawkish on Fed policy would be promoting higher interest rates. 
uh, thinking that you know we've we've kept it out there too long. It's going to be it's potentially inflationary, and then we need to kind of stem that before it ever happens. Of course, somebody who's dovish on uh, monetary policy would think we need to continue to keep providing the stimulus. We don't want to start raising rates too quick for fear of choking off an economic recovery. So uh, a milder approach, I guess you'd say, to monetary policy. Are you a hawk or a dove? You know, I... uh, uh, and personally, I, I don't know if I'd call myself hawkish. I, I really think the whole idea that higher interest rates would choke off the economy, I think, is uh, is a mindset at this point. I think we we are standing on our own. You know, granted, the the rate of uh, growth has been slow, although the GDP was revised higher earlier this week. So I think it's uh, we're, we're probably showing a little bit better growth than we are. You know, that said. Boy, a 25% basis point move when rates are still virtually zero. I, I just can't imagine why that would do any kind of major economic uh, right. damage to any of these economies. Right. In the right. equity, but so, not anything. Right. So, uh, again, more psychological than anything realistic. So. All right. Well, Dan Huber, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Certainly. My pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you for sending in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do so, and we will get expert analysis right to you. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.